Okay, first that's one. fine. Okay, go ahead. You have the floor. Okay. Um, so, uh, by good morning, everybody. So now I'm going to try to, to present to you what we have tried to achieve through a SAFIA project to improve the control of uh, the infection caused by bovine respiratory syncytial virus. And my name is uh, Jean-François Valarcher. I'm the work package leader. Sorry. I'm the work package leader for this part. But of course, I was not alone. In this work package, we're involved INRA from France with Sabine Rifo and Jean-François Elewet. In Genaza from Spain with Maria Jose Rodriguez and Marga Garcia Durand. UK uh, Perbright uh, with Geraldine Taylor and uh, Efrain Guzman. And uh, Sweden with Sarah Heglund and myself. So maybe as an introduction, I think it's quite important to remind you uh, some background. What is bovine respiratory syncytial virus infection? Oh, it's a major cause of respiratory disease in cattle. And uh, it's quite important, in fact. It can induce a quite high morbidity and quite substantial mortality, up to 20%. But this will vary in very endemic area. We will have uh, quite high morbidity and mortality, mainly in young animals. And in free herds, herds that were not infected for quite some time, it will be in adults and in cats. And it will be also sometime we could see quite high mor mortality in high producing cows. Also, alors, this virus has an effect directly on the lungs. It will destroy epithelial cells, but in addition, it will favor bacterial cell infection. And by this way, we'll use a lot of antibiotics. And you know, at nowadays, we try to fight against a true high antibiotic consumption to prevent uh, the emergence of antibio resistance. It's also a very costly disease, very costly for the farmers and also for insurances. For example, in Sweden, many farmers are insured against production losses. And uh, in Sweden, the major, uh, most of the insurance companies consider this infection as a top one. Therefore, it's very important to prevent this disease. For this, we can implement better biosecurities. But very often, it's difficult to avoid to buy animals. And therefore, we have a need of vaccine and efficient vaccine. So we have some vaccines on the market, but they are not always uh, very efficient. Sometimes we need to boost and boost animals, and it's very difficult for a farmer to vaccinate and revaccinate animals. And in addition, they have a short duration of protection. Therefore, I think it's also very important to try to have a vaccine that protects young animals. Often, young animals have maternal antibody directed against the virus. And when you vaccinate these animals with, the, with this maternal antibody, it's very difficult to get an effective vaccine. Finally, uh, so there is also something very important. Also, oh, sorry. Um, we need also, I've said, a long duration of protection. If possible, the dream would be to have a one-shot vaccine. And also, a characteristic that the vaccine can enable to differentiate vaccinated from infected animals, a DIVA property. And this would be very useful to monitor the safety, the efficacy, but also to use this vaccine in a control program. And this, I will come back at the end. <coughs> to finish this introduction, I would like to say, before starting this project, Safir, we were missing one thing is correlate of protection. How we can predict that an animal is protected without challenge? And this is very useful to avoid to use too many animals for research. But also, it would be very interesting for us to know in a population, for example, that has been infected, which one are not totally protected to be able, for example, to vaccinate them and therefore to rupture the transmission of the virus in her. And this we were missing. So to finish this introduction and this background, uh, our objective to face all of these challenges that I've tried to, to summarize was in SAFIR for us to develop a single shot DIVA BRSV vaccine, to try to identify immune, immune correlate of protection against BRSV following a natural infection or vaccination, to monitor the immunity in a herd after a natural infection, and then use this correlate to see if in this population some animals are not protected. Because often in herds we see infection each year. And it will be very good for us to know which one are not protected, to target them for, with the vaccination to rupture the transmission. 
And by this way, we could tailor the vaccination in a herd to uh, use this vaccine also to eradicate or control this virus. And finally, to develop a DIVA test, and we'll come back to that at the end. So I cannot explain what everything that we did, but we had a lot of projects at the start. And we have tried to develop a subunit vaccine. And for this, we have used all the protein of the virus. We have used a combination of protein produced in vitro. And we end up to think that maybe two proteins could be very interesting. One is pre, uh, sorry, hop, pre F. Uh, the virus has a protein named F, fusion protein. And there is one uh, very unstable, fo unstable form, which is the pre F, that <coughs> is transformed in post fusion form. And this one is stable. And the pre F is very interesting. Because, in fact, we can, uh, we, ca we can induce a lot of antibodies. It's very strong, uh, it has a very strong uh, immune uh, potential. And this PREF has been stabilized by NIH. And uh, so it was in one of the vaccines. And after, for the other one, we have added the nucleoprotein. And this we have worked, and is potentially also very interesting. So to test this, we have mixed these two proteins with uh, an adjuvant, ISA61, which is classical in, in uh, cattle, and we had a control group. And it was a group of six animals having maternal antibody, the field situation. We have waited four weeks, and then challenge. We have a very strong challenge where we nebulize virus, and they have quite strong clinical signs. And we have monitored them for one week, and then necropsy them. So here I've been summarizing, and I will go briefly, uh, a few data. The clinical score, so in clear blue, it's a control. And the two vaccinated groups are in red and uh, green. And you can see that we had a very strong clinical science, a strong, a strong uh, significance uh, for the clinical score between the control and the vaccinated, but no significant difference between the vaccinated groups. And necropsy as well, we don't see any lesions uh, in the vaccinated, and quite a lot in the control group. When we look at the virus, the cows that were vaccinated were highly protected or uh, almost uh, had a sterile protection in the upper respiratory tract compared to the control. And now when we look at in the lower respiratory tract in the bronchoalveolar lavage, we couldn't detect any virus in the bronchoalveolar lavage seven days after infection, which is the peak of the clinical science and the virological peak for us. So now we had this, uh, so based on this data, we said, okay, which one are we going to take? Both are very good, and we have selected the one that was containing only PREF, because we think that to make it usable is to try to decrease the cost of production. So we have selected the PREF. In another project as well, we had work with a lot of live attenuated virus, and we had a very good uh, candidate that was a virus to which we have deleted one gene, which is a SH gene. So we have done an experiment to now to try to answer how long this can protect. We have one shot. This was unique to get already protection four or five weeks after. Let's see what happened three months after. Often in the field with commercial vaccine, we see a lot of animals going down three months after. So we have immunized animals having always maternal antibody. So we had a control group that was immunized only with adjuvant, one group that was immunized with PREF by intramuscular route, and then the commercial vaccine that is a, probably one of the most used. Oh, it's a live vaccine administrated by intranasal route, and uh, we have our also experimental vaccine that was like this one, administrated by intranasal route. We have waited 12 weeks, then challenged the animals. And then we didn't kill as usual at day seven. We thought it was better to wait 13 days to ensure that we have no safety problem. I don't have time to speak about that, but this is an issue in RSA. And for, since we didn't euthanize the animals at day seven, we have decided to perform bronchoalveolar lavage before challenge, at the peak, and at the end. Clinically, uh, you see in clear blue again the controls. And you see the vaccinated one. In fact, all were quite very well protected. I could say I've done the clinical score. In fact, we didn't see any clinical signs 
in the group immunized with PREF, and a few with two other, like some cough or whatsoever. But our clinical scoring was not sensitive enough to show this difference. So let's say that we didn't observe any significant difference, even I think we had one. And necropsy, we had quite a lot of, uh, it was done at day 13. Usually we have a resolution of the lesions at day 13. Often we see maximum of lesions at day seven. But anyway, we could observe in the control quite a lot of lesions, also with the commercial vaccine, but known in the group vaccinated with the two uh, experimental vaccines. So now what about the virus shedding? Our virus shedding always in clear blue. We have the control, uh, the commercial vaccine in purple, and the two commercial, uh, two experimental vaccine in green and red. So it's difficult to see something, so the best is to look at here. And but again, uh, the PREF was very good. We could detect only the virus in three out of six calves. And in all the other calves, we have detected virus in all the other groups. And now if we measure the area under the curve, we can see that in fact, the control has quite a lot of virus, followed by the commercial vaccine, followed by the live attenuated, but still the best one, was the calves immunized with the PREF with our new subunit vaccine. Now, if we look at in the bronchoalveolar lavage, you remember I said we do a lava, did a lavage uh, before challenge, day seven and day 13. And again, we have detected only in calves immunized with PREF, in two calves and in very low quantity, the virus. So there again, we had a fantastic prote protection. Voila, so this was one point. You remember the other point I was saying, we didn't have any correlate of protection. We couldn't predict before challenge who was protected or not. And we have compiled uh, data from a lot of experiments between some immune parameters and the level of protection. And we could find a correlation between the level of specific IgG2, which is an isotype, a subcategory of uh, antibodies, and the level of protection, and also with some T cell response. So I will not go in detail. These assays are quite difficult to implement, but this one is quite easy. So you keep in mind that we have a quite good correlation between the level of specific IgG2 and the level of protection. In an hour, another objective of our work was to monitor uh, the immunity after an outbreak. Because we had a question, maybe we have some animals that are not well protected after an infection. So what we did, we have been to a herd, a Swedish herd, where we had a, quite a big outbreak with a mortal, more death of two cows, also quite a lot of losses in milk. And what we did was to monitor groups of animals that were just born uh, during the outbreak up to adult cows, and we have monitored each two months this animal for two years. And we have collected serums, cells, tears, uh, milk, everything. So I will not show all the data, I will just show this one. Uh, the T cell response disappeared very fast. The level of antibodies globally stay high, but we could see a difference is uh, the level on the level of IgG2. Remember the one that had a correlate of protection. So this is figures for different class of age, adult cows that were uh, cal uh, that calved at the time of the outbreak, <coughs> other adult cows, young uh, cows, etc. And what we could see is that some animals were bad responders for IgG2, and others were good responders of IgG2. So it means that probably in the population, we have some good responders and bad responders. And maybe there we need to do some more work to see if we immunize this animal, can we increase the level of IgG2? Is, uh, and the other question, of course, is to say, ask us, if we have bad responders, can this animal still replicate the virus? And maybe they are very important amplificators in the herd. So there we have still some work to do. To finish, I will say two words on the DIVA vaccine. DIVA, or maybe you don't know exactly what it is, DIVA. Or DIVA, uh, if you have a classical vaccine, you see this is a virus and you have different components at the top of the virus. And when an animal gets infected or vaccinated with a classical vaccine, the animal will produce antibodies. Again, these different components symbolized in dark, uh, blue, and red. If now you make a DIVA vaccine, what do you do? You remove one component. So we don't go in details, we remove one part. And in this case, the animals will make antibodies against the components that were present in the DIVA vaccine. So you have only black and blue. 
And if the animals are not well protected at the end of the immunity, they get infected. In this case, the virus will replicate, and they will produce antibodies that are red now. So by this way, we can make the difference between infected and uh, vaccinated and non-protected. <coughs> okay? So why we can use this? Well, of course, now when we have problem of safety or efficacy, often in the fields, the animals are vaccinated. And when we are alert, most of the time, we cannot do very much. We, serology is not useful because they have already produced antibodies against all the components of the virus. And to prove that we have a problem of safety, in this case, we need to isolate the virus. But the problem is often we are too late. So we can never investigate this. So it means that this would be very interesting to monitor the safety and the efficacy for future vaccines. And I think it will improve the societal acceptance of the vaccine in the field. The other one to finish is in the Nordic countries. Now we start to have control program against bovine respiratory syncytial virus. And the idea is to sell animals from herds where the virus does not circulate to herds where the virus does not circulate. And this is based on the level of antibody in milk for, from first calving cows. It means that when they are negative, the virus didn't circulate for two years. The problem is now we start to have a lot of herds seronegative. And when the virus can still get in, we have a very high mortality and morbidity. So we think that this vaccine, this DIVA vaccine, could be very interesting to protect animals where we have a very high infectious pressure in the environment. And if we have an introduction, in this case, the animals will be protected. Most of them will not seroconvert because the vaccine is quite efficient. And in this case, we will have no more mortality and morbidity. And after a few years, three, four, five years, we could withdraw the vaccine from the market, from the, uh, the farms, and uh, go uh, to freedom of disease. Voilà. So in conclusion, I will say that we have developed a new subunit vaccine that protect at least three months after challenge, and we have a very uh, tough challenge. That probably IgG2 are a very good uh, uh, marker or correlate of protection, but we have still work to confirm our hypothesis. And also that we have a DIVA property that I think would be very interesting for next generation vaccine to monitor the safety and the efficacy, but also to use it in a control program. And I thank everybody. It's a large team that has worked for, together for many years through different projects. And I thank you for your attention. Keep it, keep it. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Francois. Um, I have two questions, but before I do so, is there any question from the audience? Yes. This uh, subunit vaccine was more efficient than the attenuated uh, vaccine, also the commercial one. Uh, what are the reasons for that? Is it uh, uh, this the type of strain? Is it the adjuvant? Uh, and no, I no? think it's a pre-F. In fact, the, this pre-F in the virus, I was not maybe clear. When you have a virus and an infection, you express this fusion protein. And you have a form which is a pre-F. And to, be, to enable the virus to fuse the membrane, you need to be post-F. And the pre-F, in fact, is a high, induce a very high level of matter antibodies, highly immunogenic. The problem is very fugace, very f f fast to disappear. And what we did there is, in fact, this pre-F has been stabilized. And this, we think, is highly powerful. And the same vaccine, in fact, is developed in babies, in adults, and will get probably on the market, is in a clinical crawl, uh, trial in humans as well. And is, I think the reason, the main reason is the fact that this pre is stabilized and highly immunogenic and that the virus itself does not induce this. Okay. Uh, it was the same adjuvant and, uh, as well uh, between the controls. Other questions, maybe? I, I have a simple question for you. You talk about DIVA vaccination. Is it the same as what... I call a marker vaccine, or is it it's different? It's a marker, uh, yes, although it's, uh, you have two ways to mark. You have a positive way and a negative way. This is a negative way. Okay, so, negative but it by is... by subtracting something. Okay, but it is a marker, a marker vaccine. vaccine yes. Okay, because I and, am, uh, have yes. some experience with IBR in the Netherlands yes, and uh, developed so a marker IBR vaccine. Was, but it was not exactly the same purpose, because herpes virus, you are infected forever, despite vaccination. Here, we don't have persistence. It was more a way here we think to monitor the safety and the efficacy because in many countries now we start to have reluctance for vaccination. And there, in fact, with this type of vaccine, we are not serologically blind. Yeah. 
and this is a big change. Yeah. Okay. And and um, is it ready for implementation? And are manufacturers uh, interested? We have in contact with private companies uh, at the moment, but also it is to remember that in the field, often we need to have polyvalent vaccines. When you get vaccination, in fact, you, we, with this, we get vaccinated against BRSV, but we have other pathogens. So often now private companies try to integrate it in an existing vaccine. So this is a challenge, but the patent, we are not, uh, this has been produced uh, by, uh, in states by NIH, a Swiss company, and one of our partners, the partner of the patent, but uh, let, I'll let you know it's on sale. Okay. On the Thank market. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Uh, yes, what I could add, uh, one thing for this pre-F, it's highly stable, it's very low, the cost is very low, in fact. It's highly stable uh, to the heat. We can heat 75 degrees for quite some time and quite easy to produce. Yeah. Well, you said uh, the market looks for polyvalent vaccines. Uh, is it not possible to include this? As a very easy to integrate, in fact. Because it's a subunit, it's a protein, it's neutral, and uh, she's very stable, this protein. So and it's we go not to a variation of pH, etc. Okay. So this is an opportunity for a private, but you know, uh, this work, we have done all of this work on four years. We are in the process to publish all this data. So now, hopefully, a company will take over. But uh, the, the current uh, vaccination, which is used on the market, what is the rate uh, of use uh, in Europe? Uh, alors, it's very difficult to have these figures uh, because many private companies keep it secret. Uh -huh. We cannot access. But we can say that by working in the field, the classical vaccines, often you need two shots. Uh, and uh, usually you get a protection of three months. You need to reboost two times. So imagine that to get protected in months, you need four injections. Here we have only one shot. So this is already a fantastic go. And if you are not happy after three months, you can do another shot. So we have divided by two with a low cost vaccine. And in the field as well, as you can see, the, the attenuated one on the, by administrated by intranasal route uh, don't protect more than three months. Mm. So it means that as well, in Europe often, in the classical herbs, we never vaccinate forever. So we need to implement vaccination with biosecurities and to give time for the farmer to improve management, mm -hmm. to get out of vaccination. Often people don't want to vaccinate forever. Mm -hmm. Last uh, final question on the maternal immunity. Um, so at, in this stage it's no problem, but suppose that your vaccine would also be used in cows. Uh, so the maternal immunity uh, that would be conferred due to vaccination and not due to infection. Yes. In would that? Uh, uh, in cattle, we, uh, by the past it was known, or maybe this needs to be revised for this vaccine. But uh, we have tried to protect, to immunize cows, to increase the level in the colostrum. So the colostrum antibodies can be protected, but only we can vaccinate the mother to get some protection with uh, both kill and uh, leave. Uh, not with this one, but the, the kill. The live uh, commercial, we can vaccinate the mother, and also we have kill vaccine administrated by intramuscular to increase the level in, in the colostrum of specific antibodies. The problem is you get only one month of protection. And often uh, we have another challenge that we did. Uh, where Yes, alors interference, uh, this is an interesting question because with classical vaccines, in fact, I didn't show you this data, but we don't think uh, the mother of these last calves, of these uh, 24 calves, were vaccinated by uh, intramuscular route to increase the level of antibodies in the colostrum. And in fact, we didn't have much interference with the PREF. So we think that, in fact, when you have a kill vaccine or a live vaccine, we don't have a lot of PREF. In this and this and explain why probably we have not so big impact of interference and you also allowed us to use adjuvant powerful but not too much to have advert effect on the t-cell response <laughs>